Well, good day viewers. In today's exciting Drawing Board 82 video, Ollie gets on a train, explains a Fresnel lens, sees the inner workings of a lighthouse, appreciates the local talent, struggles with his new camera throughout, gets emotional, and has a great day out. If that sounds up your street, please continue watching. Good morning everyone and welcome to a grotty hostel room in Tokyo. I've got a day off today so I'm heading out to a seaside town by the name of Chosey. Now to a Brit, the concept of a seaside town will instantly evoke images of varying loathsomeness all the way from Grimsby to Bournemouth. It'll be interesting to see whereabouts this place sits, if anywhere, on that spectrum. Okay, let's go. So I boarded a bus and went to the local station where I wrestled with the ticket machine to get myself a ticket to get through the gate. I had a route around on a platform timetable trying to find a train and none of them seemed to go where I wanted to go according to the map. So eventually I found one that said 1018 in red and it had a little L beside it. And when I looked at the squiggles at the bottom of the timetable, the squiggles indicated that this might be approximately where I wanted to go. The destination board agreed with this to a certain extent as far as I could work out and in a few seconds, right on time of course, the train arrived. It's actually been built in 1993, 1994, but it seems to have been well looked after and I think the original gate turn off Thyrista drives has been replaced by IGP units. Uh, these trains are operating on 1,500 volts DC from the overhead supply. Um, it was no problem to find a seat, there was barely anybody on the train after all, and uh, I got on board for the one and a half, one hour, 40 minute ride. Now most trains in Japan, other than the high-speed Shinkansen trams and some local railways use a track gauge of 1067 millimeters. Um, this is quite a lot narrower than the standard in Europe and for fairly obvious reasons it's very difficult to make an equivalently good ride quality so local trains in Japan tend not to go that fast. Here we are in the Tokyo region at around 120 kilometers an hour and the ride wasn't great. Um, it didn't improve as we went slower into the more rural areas around Chosey and actually it was quite difficult to take reasonable pictures at this point. Train's very comfortable though, seats are great, very wide. Scheduled arrival is 11.57, as you can see, we are exactly at 11.57 at the platform. <laughs> anti-yaw damper, I think, anti-roll damper or some mechanism like that. That's it. Okay, so I'm here at the station, or one of the stations, along the line of the Chosey Electric Railway. And um, I guess the reason I'm here is because uh, whoever runs this, uh, sorry, I'm a little emotional, genuinely, um, whoever runs this little line, um, obviously experienced a lot of financial difficulties. I'm not sure of the economics of running railway lines in Japan, to be honest, um, but my understanding is that a lot of the private railways were built as they were in any country by little companies, and many of them were never nationalized or never consolidated into bigger companies. That's my understanding. Uh, so this little line runs sort of six or seven kilometers up and down the coast here and um, has been verging on bankruptcy for a number of years. And I, I just heard about it because um, they apparently have a new sort of, I don't know, CEO or something who's been pretty good at advertising and uh, whatever he's done, he's done it well and um, yeah, I came out here to have a look. Um, they're very small, uh, rural depopulation and rural poverty and so on is really behind the, um, the, the issues that the line seems to have had over the years and uh, way fewer people live here, I guess, than, than they did at one time. Um, we're relying on quite old rolling stock, which is actually quite nice. Um, so this is a 600 volt electrified railway, DC. Um, so this unit behind me here is also a 600 volt DC unit. Um, 
I would guess, it's difficult to know because I haven't seen the nameplates, but I'd guess it's sort of round about 1960s, 1970s era um, equipment that they're using here. Um, it's not in great condition to be fair, but at least it runs. And I believe the train's coming now, that might be our cue. Purely by accident, I was right, because here it is. I got on board the train, which as I said was built in 1963. Now these are at least third hand units. I checked with a guard if he'd mind if I took pictures inside and he seemed more than happy with the situation, but I'm always a little bit uncomfortable when I'm filming and there's members of the public around, so I tried not to overdo it. These units were originally built to operate on 1,500 volts DC in 1963 and they are at least third hand now so some modifications have been made to allow them to operate on the much lower voltage. They appear to be using the original camshaft control equipment which is based on a selection of series parallel switches and resistors to control speed and interestingly they look like they still have the original pneumatic braking function where the brake is connected directly to the brake valve rather than via an electro-pneumatic system. We trundled along the line at between 30 and 40 kilometers an hour and the line was as is common apparently in Japan small railways um, fully bolted so the ride was a little bit rough and robust but there were quite a few beautiful scenes throughout the 6.4 kilometer long railway including a fabulous tunnel through the trees and uh, quite a lot of fields full of cabbages. It really didn't seem like long at all before we were at the end station um, where I got off the train and wondered what to do next. At the end station of Takawa I got off the train and played around with my new camera to take some photos at least one of which I was proud of. Here in this one you can see the nameplate on one of the cars which I have no idea how to pronounce in Japanese but I can read the characters and in Chinese it means Japan East City Vehicle. So I'm assuming that that is Tokyo Wagon as you might call it in English. Now these units appear to have been reconstituted from several others so one end has got panoramic windows and the other end has an end connection and I think one end is motored and the other end is trailered but it was difficult to find any comprehensive information about it. I had a look at the map and noticed that there was a nearby lighthouse which I vaguely knew the existence of so I resolved to go check it out. Have I just stopped to photograph a field of cabbages? Yes I have. Well, it's a beautiful spot and it's a beautiful day and I have to say this would be actually quite a dramatic shot if the train came this way but unfortunately, according to the timetable that they kindly provided me with um, the next train isn't for almost an hour and although I love my viewers very much I'm not loving you enough that I'm going to stand around here in 30 degrees for an hour waiting for a train so, we're going somewhere else, follow me! A few minutes later here we have a very useful map and what it's telling us is that we are here at Squiggle Squiggle Squiggle. I found a helpful sign. It says Cape Inshu... Let's do this again. Cape Inu Boshaki is the main attraction of the Studio Tsukuba Quasi National Park and is located on the eastern edge of the Kanto area. Here, with the exception of mountain summits and remote islands, you can appreciate the year's first sunrise in Japan. The lighthouse was designed by an English engineer named R. H. Bruton and was the 24th active lighthouse in Japan in 1874. The structure is 31 meters tall and is made from bricks. With surrounded by beautiful natural landscapes, the structure is a symbol of tourism in Chosi. The lighthouse was selected as one of the world's 100 most historical lighthouses in 1998. Monuments such as the Kuhu, a stone tablet inscribed with a haiku by Koji Takahama, the Shihi, a stone tablet inscribed with the poetry of Haru Sato, and the Kahi, a stone tablet inscribed with lyrics of Shishua Ori, and many others can be found here. Very reasonable 300 yen ticket to enter the lighthouse. Let's go have a look round. Ooh, it's 
very bright outside, quite dark inside. There's lots of great stuff to look at, ships, bells. I'm going to have a look around and then I'll get back to you. I'm sure most of my viewers are fully aware of a Fresnel lens, but just in case you're not, this is a Fresnel lens. Various types of light bulb, incandescent, in nature. Some bricks, most exciting. But I think the most impressive thing in here is actually the model ships, um, some of which are very high quality, and I'd, uh, I'd have come here just for this. And with the ticket, we're allowed to go up the lighthouse, so let's go. Stomp, stomp, stomp. Up the stairs. I'm obviously not going to film the whole thing because I think you know what a spiral staircase looks like at this stage of your life. And if you don't, for you I feel only pity. What is nice, and somewhat surprising, is the sort of pine wooden panels they've got. Also you can see the traditionally extremely thick wall of a lighthouse. This is fine. Um, odd in a lighthouse that I doubt it's going to be exposed to direct sea, but uh, it's good that they've built it strong. I'm more tired than I'd like to admit as a result of way too much Asian food recently. But I think we're pretty much there. Last little up to the platform here. Take a look at what's going on in a minute. I see. Okay. I think I see what's going on. I'm going to figure out how to show you and then I'll be back. And wow, what a view. Definitely worth the 300 yen entrance fee, um, which is very reasonable, I think. What we got over here is the uh, maritime control uh, radar, which has got a weather sensor on top of it. So I'll try and zoom in and give you a look at that. Um, so most countries will have something equivalent to this. They'll have a series of navigational radars mounted around the coast, also some comms antennas, usually VHF and things like that. And they've got the anemometer and wind direction indicator. And these things will all be connected to probably a vessel traffic service and or coast guard. I'm not sure the exact setup in uh, Japan, um, which will help coordinate all these vessels going in and out around the area. And they will keep track of everything and hopefully make sure that nothing too catastrophic occurs. Right, third time lucky. First time I didn't press the record button. Second time I was talking out of my bottom. Right, what we've got here is this green yoke down here is a spindle and that is supporting via some bearings in here of this rotating green platform here. Now this rotating green platform is attached to the Fresnel lens which is up there rotating the Fresnel lens as the lighthouse operates and it's spun by this little gear driven by this AC motor with a little inverter drive. Now on the platform above us we've got the Fresnel lens and there's two gentlemen up there now changing the bulb and that rotates around the fixed light bulb that I can't really show you because it's up there maybe we'll get it. The fixed light bulb that is there being replaced. So the whole thing rotates around a light bulb. Okay, well I hope you enjoyed that little explanation of a lighthouse. Um, I for one learned a lot. Um, there was a moment when I was looking through there that I thought I must be completely wrong. What's this helical thread doing here? And uh, I was very privileged because uh, one of the young maintenance men spoke a little bit of English and he was able to explain to me that the helical system was something to do with when the lighthouse was originally built but I'm not entirely sure what. Either way it isn't used anymore and the rotary system that I've just shown you is what is used now. But um, it was certainly a great privilege to, uh, to see such work going on. I haven't experienced it before and uh, hopefully that's the sort of thing that uh, that my viewers will enjoy. So with that I think I'm going to go back to the uh, Chosey Electric Railway, uh, take the run back to Chosey, uh, buy some souvenirs which I believe is another thing they're famous for and then we'll head on back to Tokyo. So yeah definitely would recommend here. Never did I expect that I would see a rotating lighthouse for an L lens. Well, I thought that was it, so I walked back down the spiral staircase, and before I left, I thought I'd just have a quick look around the rest of the grounds. Um, there's some bells there, there's some inscriptions which I can't read on some stone, that kind of thing. Uh, there was also a very solidly constructed sheet metal former foghorn room, which was very handsome, and inside they had uh, some more equipment and examples of bits and pieces that used to hang around the lighthouse. Now, it was incredibly interesting, and I'm going to attempt to use some of the footage here, but beware that the acoustics in there were awful, so I'll try and do my best to sort it out for us. <sighs> Where's the feckin' battery? I know it's in here somewhere. Oh, 
smoothness itself. Inside the building, there were many interesting exhibits, including the entire original Fresnel lens. Now, this is one section of another lens of similar size. Originally, this particular section would have been paired with seven others to give an octagonal lens. So, as the lens rotate, eight beams of light will be focused, and that accounts for the flashing that you'll see on the lighthouse. What I'm trying to do is give a sense of scale, but also explain the general principles of the Fresnel lens, which, like any other lens, runs on refraction and total internal reflection. The point of a Fresnel lens is that you can use a relatively thin, relatively flat piece of glass and carve inclined planes on it to give an approximation of the surface of a lenticular lens without the thickness. Now, such a lens is cheap and easy to make, but it's not particularly good from an optical point of view. They are, however, more than good enough to allow the light from a lighthouse to be focused at ranges of 20, 30 miles and above. Up there, coming down from the ceiling, you have a pipe which is the actual foghorn itself. At the back of the building we've got uh, four air tanks. I would imagine low pressure, sort of 10, 15 bar, that kind of thing. Um, they are connected via underground piping, so I'm not sure what the layout is to two compressor units. Now, the compressor here on the right was most likely either the standard compressor or the more modern compressor because it's driven by an electric motor which then goes into this uh, two-stage, two-piston unit here and then through what looks to be some kind of centrifuge dryer or coalescer or some description behind it and then into the um, pipework. The second compressor over here is a diesel powered unit and again it's powering the same kind of actual compressor which is a twin cylinder device with the same kind of tank behind it which is presumably as I said for water separation or oil separation or something along those lines into those pipes and you've got two control cabinets there and again it's unclear what they do because I can't get close to them and at some point all that air will be released into the foghorn at the base here via the valve assemblies that you see here. Now originally that may well have been done manually. I'm assuming nowadays, well obviously nowadays they don't tend to use foghorns anymore um, which is why all the gauges are at zero but uh, I'm assuming that at some point that was converted to some kind of electronic timer system and that may be what you can see on the tank at the back there. Um, just here these look like uh, remote controlled pneumatic switches of some kind. So with that I walked down to the beach and after a couple of kilometres I got back to the second last station on the line where I settled in to wait for a train. It was quite an interesting station. They had um, quite a bit of uh, local artwork from local people there um, including a few exercise books which were shall we say niche in some instances. People have drawn little pictures, little written little notes, little stories. It's quite cute. I haven't been able to read any of them, but some of them are of quite a high standard. You know, this one, this one. <sighs> Japan. This one. So I waited for a train, realised I'd got the timetable wrong, but a train came along anyway, going the wrong way. I knew there was only one line and one train, so I figured I'd get on it since I had a day pass and it wasn't going to cost me anything. So I rode again down to the end station through the cabbage fields. I spoke to the driver and asked if he would mind me photographing his actions for the controls and he didn't seem to mind, so I did. He's got two primary controls, one on the left hand, which is the accelerator, and one on the right hand, which is the brake. Now, the brake lever is fully detachable. He'll take it with him when he leaves the train, and it's a double-ended train and there's only one brake lever. The acceleration lever stays in place, but there's a silver handle on it, which I gather is some kind of lock, and the driver will take that with him as well. I'm not sure how many notches he's got on his acceleration and or braking controllers, and I can't work it out from the footage. But as I mentioned earlier, they still appear to be using the original resistor based camshaft control system 
Uh, we went through the rather pretty tree tunnel along the way and many other very beautiful sights and eventually in true Japanese style to the second our reliable driver brought us back to the terminus of Chosi where he brought the train to a safe stop and took the brake handle away with him. Well I think as I was trying to say earlier um, Chosi Electric Railway is operated on the verge of bankruptcy for a number of years and how I came to hear of it was because apparently um, in an effort to save themselves one of their staff members started flogging this stuff which apparently is called Nuri Senbai. I don't know what it is but it translates as wet rice cracker. At either rate it appears to be made by the train company so uh, I've bought some of it to uh, give to the guys back in the office. <laughs> Well, uh, that's that. I think we can say a grand day out altogether, and I'm very impressed and uh, very, um, yeah, I better not say anything else. I'm a bit emotional. Okay, let's go. I got back on the train and gave a brief demonstration of the rotating seats which is a feature common in Taiwan as well as Japan and that I really like. I don't know why they don't have it in the UK or rather I do it's because they can't cram as many seats in if they have to leave space to rotate them. I have to say I had a really good day out and I was very impressed and a little bit emotional at times about the uh, Chosi Electric Railway Company. If I haven't said it enough in this video, um, I really enjoyed my trip to the area and if you get a chance, I think you should go. I think you'll enjoy it and I hope you'll enjoy it as much as I did because it's not very often I have a day out as good as that one. I'd like to thank the staff at the Lighthouse and the Railway Company for accommodating me and I'd also like to thank you for watching this video. And with that, thank you very much and have a good day.